All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from a sunny San Diego as usual. And today I'm joined by Charlene Lee, who is up in hopefully sunny San Francisco. Also very sunny up here. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And so Charlene is New York Times bestselling author of six books, including her latest one, The Disruption Mindset, Why Some Businesses Transform While Others Fail. Uh, and she has uh, authored other books and co-authored a uh, claim book like Groundswell, an entrepreneur, uh, a disruptive. Uh, she ran the Alta, Altimeter Group, which was a disruptive industry analysis firm acquired by Profit in 2015. And what I thought we'd talk about today, seeing as Charlene is an expert in all things disruption and disruptive, uh, I thought we'd talk about... Okay, so there are some dis there are some times when you want to be disruptive and you're trying to do that from a business point of view and get an edge in the market. And then there are times, unfortunately, like we're living through today, when disruption is just visited is visited upon you ex from external um, forces. So I want to get your insight, Charlene. How do you how do you advise people to react at a time like this so that they can make the most of of the disruption that has been landed upon them? Uh, it, it's interesting that the rules that apply when you're being disrupted and when you're trying to disrupt are almost exactly the same. Wow. Because what you're trying to do is to take your organization from a place of a, of a status quo into a place of exponential change. And no matter whether you're doing that under good circumstances or bad circumstances, it is just incredibly hard. And so my research found that certain organizations and leaders thrive when the, wall, the, 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 the backs are to the wall, when the challenge is facing them. Instead of shrinking back and saying, oh, this is too much, this is too hard, we've got to retreat. They go, let me at it. Let me find that opportunity. And what I find is that in times of great disruption like this, it, the needs don't go away, they shift. Mm -hmm. And the key for organizations is to figure out and sense where those customer needs are shifting to. And the people who can run fastest to those needs can identify them and, and, and take advantage of that new opportunity are the ones who are going to be able to thrive with this new change. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because we've even experienced it in our, in our own business. Uh, we have some people who have told us we're in complete shutdown now. Uh, we've gotten directed from above, no spending, put everything on hold. And then we've got other people who are continuing, as you say, continuing uh, their exploration because their needs haven't gone away they may not be physically in their offices right now, uh, but the needs haven't gone away and, and they're still looking to, to figure out what they need moving forward. And the needs have obviously evolved a little bit. But what is it, uh, what is it that uh, a leader who embraces disruption as opposed to one who takes a more conservative approach? What are some of the characteristic differences? Well, first of all, they just have this openness to change mindset, just mm -hmm. flat out. They see opportunity when there's change, when there's challenge. Uh, so when something something changes in their environment, they go, wow, that's so cool. What can I do um, to move into that? Versus seeing change as a big negative and something to be avoided. Uh, the, the best leaders who are disruptive are constantly changing themselves. They're constantly asking, how can we do things better? And so when they're trying to hack themselves anyways, when they become hacked, it's just like, well, this is just being done to me instead of me doing it, but I'm totally equipped. They have confidence that they can come out on the other side, if not completely whole, at least not a complete disaster. Yeah. And it's interesting if you think about it, because uh, resistance to change is, is kind of futile, really, anyway, isn't it? I mean, I've, we've seen this from what, we've just, what we're experiencing right now, but the, the only constant in, in life is change, and change is all around us in our personal lives and everywhere. But yet, when it comes to work, some people really try to control everything and keep everything from changing too much. And that always seems kind of like a futile exercise to me. It is. Leaders keep coming up to me now, especially now. And they're mm -hmm. like, you know, I just feel so out of control. How do I get back in control? And I'm like, I'm like look, when were you ever really in control? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, step back and think about it. You just had this fallacy, this semblance of being in control. You weren't actually in control. You were just kind of gliding along with anything without anything disturbing you. And again, disruptive leaders, what they do is they know they're paranoid. They're paranoid that what worked yesterday is not going to work today. What's working today is not going to work tomorrow. So they're constantly asking, 
How can this blow up in my face? How can I make sure that we are moving and getting better? They're constantly challenging themselves to do better. Yeah, who was it? I, and I can't remember the name escapes me, but I think it was the head of IBM at one stage when they were completely dominant. And uh, he said that he still spent his evenings worrying that there was somebody out there that was going to take them down. And this is when they were like so un almost untouchable. But he spent his time worrying about somebody out there was going to take them down. Well, it was Andy Grove who wrote a whole book, yeah. Only the Paranoid yeah. Survive. Right? Yeah, it's exactly. Then, yeah, yeah. But it, there's also something else about fear is that when things are going really well, we fear failure because things mm -hmm. are going so well. Why mess it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things have gone to pot. When things are a complete mess like they are today, you're like, hey, I got nothing. I mean, everything has stopped. So what do I have to lose? Let's go mm -hmm. try 20 things. If 19 of them fail, but one of them work, we're better off than where we were today. The disruption mm -hmm. mindset is always working in that state. That yeah. Something's not going to work. I know that what's working today isn't going to work tomorrow. So these disruptive leaders do one thing and one thing really well. They focus on the future customer. And wow. it's, a, it's a kind of an interesting idea. We know we need to be customer needs, but it's not today's customers. It's tomorrow's customers. So where are those needs coming in, in, in emerging? Yeah. And if you think about it, if you were doing that exercise a month ago, looking forward at what your future customer might look like, chances are you probably need to revisit that now because your your future customer's needs might have altered uh, radically in the meantime. But I, but I get what you're saying about always looking for, because I do think you're correct. If you are being in any way successful, you do, there is a temptation to fall into that kind of comfort zone and think, okay, we've got this figured out and not to be looking too far forward, as you say, because you're afraid you're gonna jinx it. Um, one interesting uh, thing, chapter you have in your book is uh, preparing for that big, big gulp moment. And I, I love the title of that. What, what, is the, what is the big gulp moment and how do you prepare for it? Well, the, one of the reasons why people don't like to think about the future is that it's not 100% guarantee. Yeah. And I don't wanna do anything that could be risky, that's not, I'm not gonna be rewarded for this because I'm always punished if I don't meet my 100% of my goals, et cetera. The big up moment comes when you know what you need to do and you're not 100% sure. In fact, you're probably not even 80% sure. Maybe you're only 50% sure, but you know you gotta do this. And so that big gulp is when you take it and you just kind of like <laughs> take that big swallow and just go, yeah. okay. Let's let's take that leap over that cliff. <laughs> Hopefully there was some water in the bottom of that that, yeah. that gully <laughs> to fall into it. Exactly. But it's funny if you think about it, how many times uh, when you make big significant decisions in your life, just in general, uh, whether it's uh, you know where you go to college or what job you go for or you know, who you marry or you're buying it. I mean, none of these things come with any guarantee of, uh, with 100% certainty that the outcome will be what you think. And you go into most of these things not having all the information either, right? So right. when it comes to a work, when it comes to work, you're kind of operating in the same mode that you've always been operating if you're prepared to, to look at it that way. Right. I, again, think about just like even marriage. Mm -hmm. We know from statistics, half of them fail. And yet yeah. we personally go into that, like, hey, you know, we'll, uh, one of the most important things I'll ever do, but yeah, we're, we're really taking that risk. And, and so this big gold moment comes at crucial points uh, mm -hmm. in our lives and in our organizations and as leaders. And we are marked by these crucial points. I, it literally, I, I think the most important decisions we ever make in our careers and our, in our work lives literally are made within minutes. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, will we be, when that opportunity comes, we have minutes, not days and weeks and months, minutes, hours to decide whether we're going to pull that trigger or not. And everything we do is preparing ourselves to that point to be ready to make that decision. And it's funny because you say uh, it's like I'm the one that always blows my mind is buying a house, right? Uh, where we often go and we will look at a house. We'll go in there for maybe an hour. Maybe we'll come back and look at it again for maybe an hour. And then we'll make one of our most important purchases based on that, right? And but there are so many things that we don't know about, but we're prepared to do that. And I think obviously now at this point, at this crucial point when people are, are fearful 
and there's so much change has been happened upon them. I think yeah, the, it really comes down to, to leaders to showing a little bravery, don't you think? Just showing a little, say, okay, we can, let's figure out how to move forward. And I think that's what people would be crying out right. for. And I think a bravery and courage, what those things are is when you move forward, despite knowing that mm -hmm. you don't know what the outcome is going yeah. to be, and yet you know you need to move forward. And so that, that's where leadership really comes to bear, is when you don't have the answers and you say to everybody around you, I don't know what the answers are, but I do have good questions. Mm -hmm. And I keep coming back to this. As leaders, we're not expected to have all the answers. But we are ex asking you to lead us the way, at least help us figure out what the right questions are so we can get to work, so we can focus on what it is the problem that we have to solve. Uh, and, and, and that's what we want from our leaders. You don't need to necessarily know the answer, but just give us a direction, please. Tell us that we need to go in that direction. And we'll all head that way. And I, and I think, it's, a, it's to be honest, it's a huge trust builder when people say that they don't know things, because if you, I mean, think right now, if you, if you, if there is a leader out there who's saying, I have it all figured out, and this is the plan, and we just need to go for it, it's going to work out, you can't really trust that, because you know that that's not true, right? right. They don't have all the, and, and I always think it's a great trust. I remember one time years and years ago going to a highly acclaimed uh, acupuncturist, right? Really, really well, and highly, one of the best around, and he put one needle in and it really hurt somewhere, right? And none of them ever used to hurt and it really hurt. And I said, oh, that really hurt. Why was that? Because, no idea. Because sometimes that just happens. And, <laughs> and, we, and uh, you know, and in that moment, I was like, okay, well, at least that was honest because you could have just given me some, you know, some ridiculous excuse or whatever. But he just looked at me and he's, you know, top of his practice or whatever, well known, just goes, no, no, happens sometimes. And I think... That's and I think that's a huge trust builder, though, is that somebody is willing to say, I don't know. And like you said, a leader willing to say, I don't know. I don't know where this is going to go. I have some good ideas. I have some questions. We have a lot of brain power. And if we all come together, we can, we'll find a way through. Yeah, what I really like is that acupuncturist. But by him saying, I don't know. But he also was implying, and it's okay. Yeah, right? precisely. You don't have yeah. to worry about it. It hurts, but <laughs> I've seen it before. It's not going to be a problem. <laughs> I'm struck by um, what the governor of Kentucky has been doing at five o'clock in his news briefings every day. Um, he just gets up there and he says the same thing over and over again. We're going to be okay. You know, we'll get through this. Mm -hmm. But he's repeating, he's literally saying the same thing every single day with whatever information he has. And he says, these are the information points that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be okay. And he says yeah. that over and over and over again. And everybody goes, yes, we will be okay. And I think one of the most important things that leaders need to do in this time is to repeat it over and over and over again, is that we're going to be okay. Yeah. This is why we're here. This is our purpose. This is our mission. These are our values. They have not changed. Mm -hmm. In this world of things constantly changing, there are certain constants. We are still good with each other. We still have each other. We're going to be supportive. I find that the leaders who are just wholesaling, closing down their business, laying everybody out to preserve the bottom line, Again, who knows what the circumstances are, but if he were to ask 100% of his people to say, would you lay off 30% or would you all take a 30% pay cut? I think they would all raise their hands and say, we'll all take a 30% pay cut. Yeah, and I, think that's, and I think that's a critical thing too, is uh, what you mentioned there about we're going to be okay because uh, you, you're an entrepreneur and uh, and you you know lots of entrepreneurs and you know when people are going through building a business there are some points when it's it's really it's really stressful and everything is doesn't look like it's it's working out and maybe the money's running out and all of that and sometimes just telling yourself or the group around you you go we will find a way. We'll, there's a solution here somewhere and we'll find a way through, even if you can't see it at that moment, is, is a huge part of being able to be successful ultimately. Yes. And, and I've done my share of pivots and layoffs. Some of them mm -hmm. have done extremely well. Some of them I've just been horrible at because I didn't say that. I didn't mm -hmm. feel okay. And I didn't right. have that place of being centered to be able to tell everybody else that we we're going to be okay. And so, again, one of the most important things to realize now as leaders is that we are in a highly anxious and fearful time. And so we really, really need to get that moment of, of that clarity and centering. And that can be really hard when everything is going coming at us. 
and we're dealing with things on the personal side. There's a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety. Yeah. I, I find it so much easier as a leader to be able to share very honest with people. I'm not in a good place, but I know mm. this is what we have to do. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, and I, think, I think it comes back to that on, that honesty and trust thing because if you are if you are honest and open and uh, people will trust you more, yeah, they may not agree with what you do, they may not agree with your decisions, but if they if ultimate and sometimes when it is something like if it's somebody's job that's lost or whatever, yeah, yeah, they're probably not going to like you that much for a while, but ultimately, sometime down the road, they will at least be able to look back and go, I understand why they did it and they did it in the best way and they're a decent person, and I think that's. That's all you can hope for sometimes. Um, but, but back to your point again, I mean, I think uh, there is there is opportunity now if people want to look at it. There's opportunity. Think of all the opportunities you can look at. How do you organize your business right now? If people have all gone home and they're remote working and you're finding that it's actually maybe more efficient, they may be happier doing it in the long run, whatever. Maybe you have discovered a way of efficiency and having happier employees. We're yeah. fortunate. We've been doing it for, we've been running a, a largely virtual company for about six years deliberately. We made a decision to do it. And so, you know, we haven't missed a beat. But I'll tell you one thing, we have seen huge productivity and efficiency gains. And I think that's where, if you, if you, look, at, if you look at your business, and you look at all these different things that have now been forced upon you, you might discover there are really great opportunities in there to do things different. Absolutely. And if you think about this whole idea of digital transformation, mm -hmm. and people just kind of have put it off, they yeah, kind of have yeah. seriously, well, here you go, <laughs> right here, mm -hmm. right you're being pushed right into the middle of it. And one of the most important things about digital transformation that people realize is that it's never about the technology. It's never about the digital part. It's the transformation part. It's the people part. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what we have now here is a really interesting opportunity again. This disruption creates opportunities for change. And here's an opportunity to really rethink your business practices. And one of the most important things I encourage people to do, especially um, if you're in a situation where you are working with distributed teams, where people mm -hmm. are in a knowledge and a desk in yeah. the environment, yeah. Don't think about it as remote workers and not remote workers. Think about it as a distributed team and that yeah. everybody is remote. Even when you, quote, go back to being normal, keep that mindset. Because mm -hmm. the minute you think that somebody is a first-class citizen because they're in the office with you, and then second-class citizen because they're remote, everything goes to pot. Yeah. So it's, it's a much better way to think of everybody being distributed and how would you collaborate, communicate, make decisions Good meetings in a completely different way. Yeah, and to be honest, I have sat in the offices for many years with people who are extremely remote, and they've been sitting very close to me. So, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's sort of. But but to your point about digital digital transformation, I do. I think uh, I was writing something the other day where I was just thinking that uh, you know proximity is sometimes the enemy of process, right? Because if people are all around you, you can overcome. Uh, you can overcome inefficient processes because you can hop over here and get this and hop over. And over time, you you just compensate for all these things. But you don't realize that when those people move on or they're not there or they're whatever, like the whole process breaks down. So in a way, sometimes by all being together in a, in a physical building, you've avoided doing the work of process. And as you say, process is about people and it's about efficiency. It's not about technology. Yes. I mean, one of the first rules of working in a distributed team is that process and structure is incredibly mm -hmm. important. Yeah. So you lay down and make very clear what your process is. And one way to think about this is how do you welcome new team members? How do you celebrate things? Um, and a lot of ways that people bring on new, do the onboarding is they assign them a buddy and the buddy takes them around and shows them everything they think mm -hmm. is important. Yeah. But it's completely up to that buddy to decide what's that onboarding going to look like. It is not right. like a checklist that everything that this person needs to know. That is not a good process. Uh, good so question. if you think about having to write everything down, that actually creates better processes, better structures, better rituals and lore. And what I found in my research with disruptive organizations, they are extremely well run. They're extremely structured and extremely process oriented, which in some ways doesn't make sense because they are so creative and innovative. Mm -hmm. But think about this. I mean, you don't have to worry about how work gets done. Then you can focus on the work that needs to be done. Yeah, I think that's, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful one to end on because I love that. Just repeat that again for everybody. 
when you don't have to worry about how work gets done, you can focus on the work that needs to get done. Yeah, I think, okay, I think that's a fantastic message to come out of this for everybody. Now you've got to look at your digital your digital process, look at your processes and look at them from a point of view of making people more efficient, okay? Taking away redundant manual work, taking away uh, unnecessary steps, but unlocking people's power to, to be successful by getting your processes right because process is your friend at the end of the day. I don't know, people have spent a lot of time you know, bad mouthing process over the years as if process and agility are, are enemies when not, they're actually extremely good friends. Absolutely. All right. Listen, Charlene, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Charlene's information, links to her books, will be in her contributor profile. But before we go, Charlene, just want to share with people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yes. Um, so I am a full time analyst at a company called Altimeter. I'm a senior fellow there. Uh, but I also write a lot of books, do a lot of speaking. Mm -hmm. And I started my little passion project, which is a community to help disruptive leaders. Um, and support their quest to create exponential growth. And that is called Quantum Networks. And you can find it at quantum-networks with an S.com. Excellent. And we'll include that as well so people can find that. Again, listen, thanks, Charlene. This has been fantastic. Very timely, uh, very timely having you on the show. So uh, thank you for that. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.